The human heart is a four-chambered structure. There are two atria and two ventricles. The two atria, that is the right and the left atrium, are located on the superior aspect of the heart. And they are separated by a structure called the interatrial septum, which unfortunately is not seen in this diagram here. The two ventricles, that is the right and the left ventricle, are located on the inferior aspect of the heart. And they are separated by the interventricular septum. So there are small grooves on the surface of the heart where major blood vessels are located. The coronary sulcus, which is also called the atrioventricular groove, is a major landmark between the atria and the ventricles. The anterior interventricular sulcus is a good surface landmark that approximately shows where the interventricular septum is located. This anterior interventricular sulcus contains the anterior interventricular artery, which is an artery of the coronary circulation. And we'll see more about the coronary circulation later. But briefly, the coronary circulation is the blood vessels that nourish the myocardium of somewhat of the atria, but mostly of the ventricles. Turning around, looking at the posterior aspect of the heart, we see that there is a posterior interventricular sulcus. This is a major surface landmark uh, that identifies the posterior location of the interventricular septum. It contains a artery that is referred to as the posterior interventricular artery. So returning to the chambers of the heart, we'll begin with the atria. The atria are the receiving chambers of the heart because they're receiving blood from the major veins. Recall that veins are always returning blood to the heart. The atria are also smaller than the ventricles because they don't have to push blood as far as the ventricles do. We see that we have a right atrium and a left atrium. The auricles are small wrinkled appendages that are found on the inferior part of each atrium. And the auricles function to increase the atrial volume a little bit. So interiorly, uh, we see that the right atrium has small folds of muscle tissue that are referred to as the pectinate muscles. The pectinate muscles are thought to help increase the volume in the right atrium as the right atrium fills. Another structure that we see in the right atrium is the fossa ovalis, and this is a small oval-shaped indentation that's found in the interatrial septum. The fossa ovalis is a remnant of the foramen ovale, the foramen ovale is a small opening between the right and the left atrium that helps uh, blood in the fetal cardiovascular system bypass the pulmonary circuit because during fetal development, the lungs are not yet operational. And so the foramen ovale is a small passageway that allows blood to travel from the right atrium to the left atrium. So in this image of a dissected right atrium, we see the opening to the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, the pectinate muscles, as well as the fossa ovalis, which here is called the oval fossa. The interatrial septum, which was not visible in previous diagrams, is shown here. It is the wall that separates the right atrium from the left atrium, and this helps to prevent the mixing of the oxygenated blood in the left atrium with the deoxygenated blood in the right atrium. There are three veins that drain their blood into the right atrium. So recall that the atria are the receiving chambers of the heart, so only veins, which are returning blood to the heart, will drain into the atria. The first vein that drains into the right atrium is the superior vena cava, which is shown here. The remaining two are visible from the posterior side, and the second of the veins that drains into the right atrium is the inferior vena cava, and the third is the coronary sinus. So the superior vena cava is mostly draining blood from the head and the neck uh, into the right atrium, the inferior vena cava is primarily draining blood from the uh, thoracic cavity, the abdominal cavity, and the lower limbs into the right atrium. 
And the coronary sinus is draining blood from the coronary circulation into the right atrium. So in the left atrium, we see that there are four veins that drain into it. The two right pulmonary veins and the two left pulmonary veins, which gives us our total of four veins. Don't let the diagram here confuse you because it appears that the right pulmonary veins are connected to and draining into the right atrium, but in fact, they're actually draining into the left atrium, which we'll get a little bit better perspective on the next slide here. So because it was difficult to trace the path of those right pulmonary veins in the previous diagram, we see that from the posterior side, it's easy to see that they enter in almost the exact same place that the left pulmonary veins do. The ventricles are referred to as the pumping chambers because they are responsible for pushing blood into the body's arteries. The walls of the ventricles are much thicker and much more muscular than the atria because the uh, ventricles must push blood further than the atria do. There are a few features that are found in the walls of the ventricles that we don't see in the walls of the atria. The first feature are called the trabeculi carnii, which means the crossbars of flesh that line the ventricle walls. These crossbars of flesh function to reduce the suction that is created when the ventricles contract. The second feature that is seen in the ventricles that we don't see in the atria are the papillary muscles, which control the tricuspid and the bicuspid valves. These are sets of valves that are located between the atria and the ventricles. The papillary muscles help to anchor a fiber-like structure called the chordae tendineae, which means the tendinous cords that originate from the valves and attach to the papillary muscles. So when the ventricles contract, the papillary muscles also contract and put tension on the chordae tendineae. The cords prevent the bicuspid and dricuspid valves from being forced back into the atria when the ventricles contract and generate pressure. So when the right ventricle contracts, it's going to push blood into the pulmonary trunk, which is the artery that's going to take blood to the right and left pulmonary arteries, and that blood will be sent to the lungs to pick up oxygen. When the left ventricle contracts, it's going to push blood into a large artery called the aorta, which is the main systemic artery, and that's going to take blood to all of the systemic blood vessels, with the exception of the blood vessels that are serving the, uh, the lungs or going to the lung tissue. 